Hello there, and welcome to a Cloudera education session. This session's topic is going to be Hadoop 101, an introduction to the basics. This is a great place to start if you're just learning about Hadoop, or if you're a little rusty and want to refresh your memory. We'll be covering three core topics in today's session. The first is a brief history of data management in Hadoop. This will help set context for why Hadoop really is such a game-changing technology. Next, we'll dive into the components of Hadoop's core and talk about how each of the components work together. Finally, we'll take our first steps into the broader ecosystem that makes the technology so powerful. So, let's get started with a bit of a history lesson. Let me take you back to the 1980s for a moment. Back then, Madonna and Michael Jackson were topping the charts, Ferris Bueller took an epic day off, and big hair was more of a topic of conversation than big data. Now, in computing, the big data of the 80s was the client-server model. This was exciting because you could start to break apart your workloads. Clients could attach to a server, and it was a paradigm where the server owned the data, clients would come to the server, and the server would provide data to them. This was fun and exciting, and it was going to change the world, but it had limitations. For example, if you load it up too much, then suddenly your server is not too happy with you. There was a limit to what back-end servers could deal with too. So, at the end of the day, this could leave you with unhappy clients and an overloaded server. So, what can you do about that? There were a couple of options. The most obvious answer is to get a bigger, stronger box. This was a great solution, and upgrading hardware is still a popular choice today in any tech environment. However, it can get pretty expensive to do that. Another idea, which came from the scientific computing space, was to instead of making it one big machine, why don't we do something like a storage area network or a distributed file system? Here, there's a central point of contact to determine which server you want to talk to, and then you have many back-end servers that are shouldering the load. This approach will yield better scalability than just upgrading your back-end machine, but you still have trouble when the clients can overwhelm the servers. If you put a ton of servers in here, then you get smoke out of your distributed file system, and your servers are bottlenecked and unhappy. No matter how you try to carve this, the separation between the back-end owner of the data and the client-side user of the data, your clients can always overwhelm the system. It's a fact of the architecture. So, if putting your box on steroids can get expensive, and if a distributed file system can be overwhelmed, what's the answer? Well, to use another 80s reference, let's go back to the future. Fast forward to the internet age, and Google needed to create a file system to be able to take on a formidable task, indexing the web. To tackle this, they created something called GFS, the Google File System. The idea with GFS is that instead of having a giant file storage appliance sitting in the back end somewhere, you can instead use industry standard hardware on a large scale and drive high performance through the sheer number of components. Given that it's standard hardware, you would expect failure, and you make it reliable through redundancy and replication. Now, all hardware fails at some point, and if you have thousands of nodes, it's likely that you will have node failure frequently. If you just take the average time between failure and apply that to thousands of nodes, it will happen pretty frequently. But, in this model it doesn't really matter, because your data doesn't live in any one place. It's replicated three times around the network to ensure availability, so the rest of the active nodes just keep marching along. Even better, this replication means the data is broken into chunks and spread throughout many nodes, so now there is no central storage to overwhelm. This also provides scale. As you add more nodes, you add more computing power, and you're adding more storage capacity. So, you have a system that can scale rapidly and without much trouble. Google then paired this storage system with a new computing model called MapReduce. The concept had been around for a while, but this was really the first time it became an industry-changing event. Previously, it had been a research topic. The idea is that you take your task, which is data-oriented, and you chunk it up and distribute it on the network such that every piece of work is done within the network by the machine that has the piece of data that needs to be worked on. So now, not only does your storage scale to compute implicitly, but you need a lot less network bandwidth because you're not transferring massive amounts of data around. The data lives where the data will be used. It's like your data works from home. So, that's the story of Google. Where does Hadoop come into this? Well, Google was kind enough to publish white papers on this breakthrough out to the general public. As you can imagine, this created a ton of buzz in the community, and people started to take notice. Now, of those taking note, two people in particular mattered. Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarella. They created their own version, and Doug named the project after his son's toy elephant, and the initial version of what we now know as Hadoop was created. Since then, Doug has moved on to the highest of callings, working here at Cloudera. Now that we've reviewed the history of data management in Hadoop, 
let's dive into an introduction to the core components of the software. Now, Hadoop can be a complicated topic. Sometimes it seems like there are more animals and funny names than you can shake a stick at. Trying to make sense of it all at once can be difficult and confusing, but it doesn't need to be. If we start from the ground up and build our understanding step by step, you'll see that it's more straightforward than it seems at first pass. Let's get started with the foundation of Hadoop. At its core, Hadoop started out as a distributed file system in a processing paradigm. That file system is called HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. The processing paradigm is called MapReduce. Let's start with HDFS. HDFS is a file system written in Java, which sits on top of the native filing system for whatever OS you operate. It's built on top of x86 standards, which are very cost effective when it comes to processing, particularly when compared to high performance computing, or HPC. HPC certainly has its place and is a great technology, but it's not a prerequisite for a Hadoop ecosystem. When it comes to x86, there are reference architectures for whatever brand of server you'd like to use, so there is a lot of flexibility. As we discussed earlier, Hadoop is built to expect failures from these servers. Generally, the idea is that the data comes in, it lives on these servers, and you can push workloads to each of these servers to live locally rather than pulling it into a central location. That's a huge advantage. Now, let's talk about MapReduce. MapReduce is a processing paradigm that pairs with HDFS. At its core, Hadoop is just this, MapReduce and HDFS. MapReduce is a distributed computation algorithm that pushes the compute down to each of the x86 servers that we discussed earlier. Now, Hadoop Distributed File System. That's about as descriptive as a title as it can get. Where the heck does MapReduce come from? Well, it's the combination of a map procedure and a reduce procedure. The map procedure performs filtering and sorting of the data, and the reduce procedure performs summary operations. So, in a simple example, say you want to get a sense of how many spades are in a deck of cards. You never know what's in a deck that you already use. Some cards get lost, some get found. You know how that goes. There's a pretty straightforward way to count the spades. You can go through the deck and count each of them as you come across them. However, that can take a while. You'll need to go through the entire deck on your own. Now, unless you're playing solitaire, chances are you have a few friends you're sitting down to play with. So, if you divide that deck of cards up into four, and then distribute the cards amongst your friends, they can count the number of spades in the divided deck in a fraction of the time. Then you can simply add the number of spades you come across, and you arrive at the answer. That's essentially what MapReduce does. By telling each person to count, you're doing a mapping procedure. By having them boil the cards down to a number rather than just handing them back to you, they've done a reduce. So, you can think of each person as a computer in this example, and since they're working on one job together, we'll call them a cluster. That covers off some more terminology for you. So that's a pretty easy example, but you might be thinking, hey, I could have done that on my own. What do I need Hadoop for? Well, there are only so many cards in a deck, so you're right, but we call it big data for a reason. Hadoop is meant to tackle problems large in scale. Say instead of cards, you were trying to gauge sentiment towards a candidate for public office by looking at the words most commonly associated with her on Twitter. The data set and challenge become much more difficult, and that's where Hadoop can make a big difference. Hey, now look at that. You now know what the core of Hadoop is all about. That was easy. But we're not going to stop just yet, and neither did the Hadoop community. Users of the system knew that there were some missing capabilities. They needed to get data into Hadoop, get it out, manage the resources, schedule jobs, and even more. As a result, a broader open source community got to work building out a broader ecosystem. And as a result of this work, Hadoop has much more to offer. Let's now move on to the next section of this session and take a few steps into the broader Hadoop ecosystem. We'll take it step by step and help you understand how the ecosystem works together in a way that makes sense. The first additional component we'll discuss is Yarn. Yarn is a resource manager for different workloads that you plug in on top of Hadoop. It manages compute resources and clusters and works to schedule users' applications. Again, here we run into a strange name. Why Yarn? Well, very simply, is an acronym that stands for Yet Another Resource Negotiator. So apparently Hadoop comes with a sense of humor too. So, thus far we've talked a lot about Hadoop, but we still haven't talked about the data. How do we get the data into the system to actually start to process it? And how do we work with different kinds of data? Well, the good news is that tools have been developed to help us out. Now, when it comes to relational databases, we can pull data from there into HDFS using a tool called Scoop. Now boy, that's another odd name, isn't it? And it's spelled funny too. Well again, there's a method to the madness. This one was arrived at by combining SQL and Hadoop. And you can think of it as scooping data out of relational databases. In addition to pulling data from databases, Scoop will also allow you to push it out to them as well. Scoop can also compress data to help it make the journey. Scoop is used frequently in Hadoop distributions, 
But you can also imagine any set of ETL, which stands for Extract, Transform, Load, companies doing the same thing with the graphical interface. However, we won't focus on those tools right now because we're trying to stay within the parameters of the Hadoop ecosystem. Now, we've discussed relational databases, but what about other things like web server logs, networking logs, and sensor information? These are less straightforward than a relational database. How do we handle them? That's where Flume comes into play. It is a massively distributable framework for event-based data. With Flume, we can now bring streaming event data into HDFS. Again, why Flume? Well, if you think about a physical Flume for logging, it's a little river that roots logs and wood to processing factories so they can cut it up and ship wood. The same way they do this for physical logs, we do the same for data logs. So, now we've got all the data loaded in, we have Core Hadoop, and Yarn as a resource manager to make sure things go well. What's next? Let's talk about Hive. Having data in HDFS now, let's say we want to do some work on it. We can write some Java, Ruby, Perl to do some work. However, people are getting tired of writing thousands of lines of code when a few lines of SQL would work. So, Hive was created to do just that. Hive allows you to run SQL that is converted to MapReduce that can run against HDFS. So, now you can get this massively powerful processing in terms of SQL, which is great for usability. Apache Pig was created as a higher level scripting language that allows you to create MapReduce programs to run against your data. It is slightly analogous to Oracle's PL SQL. You can think of Pig as having a massive appetite for data to make it easier to remember. Now, if we look at both Pig and Hive, they help us process massive amounts of data, but aren't always the best for low latency SQL. So, if you want to hook reporting tools to things, that creates a little bit of an issue. But, as you might have guessed, there's a solution to that. Impala is designed as a low latency SQL engine that bypasses MapReduce, as you can see depicted on the screen. This is along the same lines as SQL queries. For example, a query to return 10 rows from a 1,000 row table in Hive is going to take 20 to 30 seconds or so. However, using Impala, it takes only milliseconds. This blazing speed is also how Impala came to be the name for this component of the Hadoop ecosystem. Now let's talk about search. That's where Solar comes into play, which allows the indexing of all your Hadoop data. This comes in handy if you'd like to search, or Google if you will, your Hadoop data. With Solar, there is the flexibility to route the data being brought in by Scoop and Flume directly into Solar to do indexing on the fly. However, you could also tell Solar to index that data in batches. That's pretty neat if you ask me. There are software companies that integrate well with the Solar API that will allow you to do searches on your data, even if you don't know it too well. Now let's get to a rising star in the ecosystem, Apache Spark. Spark has generated a lot of buzz recently with the ecosystem and is delivering on its promise. This is a technology that may be able to ultimately replace MapReduce down the road, in addition to providing real-time streaming capabilities and machine learning. Pretty cool stuff. Now, when it comes to MapReduce, it uses specific technology and a specific approach to breaking up calculations. Spark, on the other hand, allows you to use a more traditional API for analyzing data that doesn't make you think in terms of MapReduce. It also leverages in-memory work more than MapReduce can. This means if there are multiple phases or iterations on calculations, Spark can do this in memory rather than writing to disk between each of the phases or iterations. This makes for much faster speed. As Spark becomes more mature, there will eventually be the same ease of use tools for batch processing. Now this is great. We have Hive, Pig, Impala, Solar, Spark, and many components to the ecosystem. But how can we do authentication? We may not want Bob to see Mary's table or vice versa. Sentry fills this gap and it creates role-based authentication, which is critical, again, critical for security. For this introduction, we'll end with Sentry, though there are many more components to the ecosystem. Hopefully, you're feeling more comfortable with Hadoop now and have a good idea of how these components come together to help you access data like never before. Now that we've covered Hadoop's core and a bit of its broader ecosystem, let's talk about how Cloudera fits into this picture. You know we know Hadoop, but let's talk some specifics. Looking at this ecosystem, we all know that it's open source via the Apache Foundation. But even there, the projects need to have an origin or inventor. You'll see from the Cloudera logos which ones have been conceived by Cloudera's current or former employees. This leadership is unmatched within the open source community. Now, even with this great technology, it can be pretty difficult to pull in software from open source and get it running all on your own. That's why Cloudera packages its own distribution of Hadoop, known as CDH. It comes from Cloudera, but is still 100% open source Apache software. 
We make it easier through QA testing for quality and backwards compatibility, among other things. In addition to packaging the software, Cloudera also has a few value-add, enterprise-ready tools that make it much easier for you to drive value from your data. Let's take a quick tour of these before we end. Cloudera Manager is a tool that manages the entire Hadoop infrastructure for you. Built into Cloudera Manager is the tool that enables you to configure all of the aforementioned products. The deployment and management framework in Cloudera Manager is industry leading. Cloudera Navigator is the only native end-to-end -end governance solution for Apache Hadoop based systems. Through a single user interface, it provides visibility for administrators, data managers, data scientists, and analysts to secure, govern, and explore the large amounts of diverse data that land in Hadoop. Within Navigator, Key Trustee is a virtual safe deposit box for managing encryption keys, certificates, and passwords. It provides software-based key and certificate management that supports a variety of robust, configurable, and easy-to-implement policies governing access to the secure artifacts. Cloudera Navigator is a part of Cloudera Enterprise's comprehensive data security and governance offering and is a key part, pun intended, to meeting compliance and regulatory requirements. Cloudera Director will allow you to deploy Hadoop to the cloud with best practices determined by Cloudera's Hadoop experts. Cloudera Director partners tightly with Cloudera Manager and in a somewhat complex environment makes things easier. After all, it's enough trouble to get your head around cloud or Hadoop when they're on their own, let alone when they're working together. We can make it easy for you with the first portable self-service tool for deploying and managing Hadoop in the cloud. That brings us to the end of today's education session on Hadoop 101. I hope you found this session useful and encourage you to visit cloudera.com to learn even more about Hadoop and what Cloudera has to offer. Thanks for watching.